Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. All right, very good. All right, brothers, let me uh, point your eyes to Acts chapter 12, and let's, let's start in the Word of God tonight. We'll bounce around a little bit. We'll go to Acts chapter 12, from there to Revelation chapter 22, from there to John chapter 1, and then we'll get to our notes. We are Calvary Bible Church after all, right? We, we have to make sure we get in the Bible a little bit or else we would not be living up to our names. It's good to see your smiling faces. I flew all the way from Israel to be with you tonight. Yeah, yeah. So I, hope... oh, I tell you. I tell you. Yeah. That's good. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we celebrate the fact that we have nothing really to compare you to. You are perfectly unique. And Lord, as we think about your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, fully man, fully God, one person, a real human being, and, and genuinely possessing the fullness of deity in bodily form, our hearts are affected by that. Our minds are challenged by that. We know that we can't completely understand all these things. But Lord, I pray tonight that you would give us wisdom, clarity, the ability to think, the ability to speak, so that we can help one another along this road uh, to deeper fellowship with you and with one another, more consistent obedience. And we ask this to the praise of your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, much of what we cover tonight uh, will be a little bit of a review from last week. We'll be talking tonight about the humanity and the deity of Jesus. But before we get there, I wanted to focus on a couple of passages and draw some things out. In Acts chapter 12, verse 20, we see a man who is very happy to be worshipped as a god. And we're going to see how God handles that. Okay, so in Acts chapter 12, verse 20, my friends, we find this. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord, and having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country, for food. Now, let's get that squarely in our minds before we read the rest of the text. They approached Herod because he was mad at them, and they wanted to do whatever they could to make him feel good about himself so that he'll begin to, to, to feed them and to supply them. And so they were, they, were, they were blowing smoke a little bit. They were trying to puff him up. And so... Um, at the, end, at the end of verse 20, it says that they were relying on him for food. In verse 21, on an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. Now, Herod's preaching to them, right? And he dressed up for it. He, he is really playing the part of someone important. And notice what they say in verse 22. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. Now, how does Herod handle that? He accepts it, right? At least that's what we're led to believe, because immediately we find this in verse 23. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. Do you see how God feels about men accepting worship? God hates it. It angers him, and because of that, he struck Herod dead. And Herod died and was eaten by worms, and it was a, a whole big thing. So God does not like men accepting worship as if they were God. Would you please turn with me to Revelation 22? In Revelation 22, we find a, a similar situation, and we want to see how God handles this. As you know, the book of Revelation is written by John, who had this vision of, of angels and all these other things. And it says in Revelation 22 and verse 8, this is John the author saying this, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I saw them, 
I fell down to worship at the feet of an angel who showed them to me. Now here's the situation. The angel had shown these amazing visions to John, and John wanted to hit his knees and worship the angel. How will the angel handle this? Well, let's look. Verse 9. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. You see that the angel did exactly what Herod did not do. The angel did not accept worship. Instead, he pointed John back to the only one who should receive worship, that is God. Okay? Okay, so we have one more passage to look at. John chapter 20. For this point, at least. John 20. I love this. In John 20, we'll look at verse, starting at verse 26. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked and you know, that's why we had the doors locked earlier tonight, just as an object lesson. Glad you made it through. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, I, I, I'm amazed by this. Put your finger here and see my hands and, and put your hand and place it on my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. What is Jesus going to do here? We saw that when a man accepts worship that only God deserves, God strikes him dead. We see when an angel is offered worship that only God deserves, the angel points him back to God. What will Jesus do? Well, notice in verse 29, Jesus said to him, why are you doing this? Don't worship me. No, he says this, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Friends, I want you to notice what Jesus does not do. He does not redirect the worship. That's huge. Because if Jesus is just a man, that's blasphemy. If Jesus is just like you and me, the same level as you and me, God should have struck him dead. But Jesus isn't like you and me. He's not on the same level as you and me. He is a worthy object of our worship. He's different. We're going to talk about that tonight. But I want you to notice two things in the passage we just read. One, he's pointing to his, his wrists and his side. He's reminding them that he's still human. He still has a body. And then he accepts their worship. Okay, one more passage. John chapter 1. And we'll use this to usher our minds into our notes for tonight. John chapter 1. Verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now just in that one verse, I mean, it's poetry, right? That is... A, a, a phrase too sublime to really totally understand. But notice that we see this, that this verse asserts that the word was with God. That means there's some sense in which there's a separation between the two. And the word was God. So there's some sense in which their nature is the same. Verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. So this word is the creator or the means by which things are created and without him not was not anything made that was made now let me ask you this what one thing was not made god right everything else was made so when this says that there was nothing that was made that wasn't made through him he's basically what he's saying is that he made everything Verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now we skip then to verse 12. I'm sorry, verse 14, where it says this, And the word, 
This, this being who was with God and who was God became flesh. He became a real human being and he dwelt among us. He walked on the same spinning world that we walk on. One of the most amazing things about being in Israel last week, and there's a ton of amazing things, but there were times when we were literally walking in places where Jesus walked. We're on the Sea of Galilee. We don't know where Jesus walked across, but we know that he did. We know that he was on that sea, and we're thinking we could very well be in the exact same spot that Jesus was at one point. Jesus became what we are and dwelt among us. He lived on this earth. Okay? And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So tonight what we're going to talk about is the person of Jesus Christ, and we're going to talk about really two main subjects. One, that Jesus is really human, and two, that he is really God, and then we'll talk about how those things might work together. So on page 12 of your notes, Section 3, Lesson 2, The Person of Jesus Christ, Part 2. I think it's page 12. It's page 12 on mine. It says, The, uh, the importance of Jesus' humanity cannot be overstated or overestimated. For the issue in the incarnation is soteriological. That is, it pertains to our salvation. That's just a fancy way of saying this. Jesus had to be really man to save us. That's why his name is Yeshua or Jesus. It means salvation. The human problem is the gap between us and God. The gap is, to be sure, ontological. That's just a fancy way of saying that his being is different than our being. God is far superior to humans, so much so that he cannot be known by unaided human reason. There also is a spiritual and moral gap between the two, a gap created by humans' sin. If there is to be fellowship between the two, they have to be united in some way. That is, it is traditionally understood, has been accomplished by the incarnation in which deity and humanity were united in one person. That is just a really long way of saying this. For God to save us, for Jesus to save us, he must have the essence of God to be good enough to be our sacrifice, but he has to be human in order to actually live a life that we could have lived. He has to be both. It has to be united in some way. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about how to, to defend these things. So why is it necessary to study the humanity of Christ? Well, because of an ancient heresy. All of the earliest controversies were on this very question. And it may surprise you to realize that in the early, early church, they had no problem believing that Jesus was divine. They struggled with the idea that he was actually human. Remember, in the Roman context, they had gods for everything. I mean, they even had statues to unknown gods just in case they missed some. So when Christians came along and said, Jesus is God, they, they were like, sure, add him to the list. But what they struggled with is that Jesus was actually human because to suffer the way Jesus suffered and to be mocked the way he was mocked in a Roman mind was just unfit for any god. After all, they, they worshiped their Caesars as mighty victorious champions. So Gnosticism and, and Docetism, the early heresies, really denied whether or not Jesus was human. They, they didn't have any issue, apparently, with his deity. So the current controversy is always this, that we need to understand that Jesus is really a human because most of the time, especially on, on Discovery Channel and other things, if they even admit that he's a human, they're very quick to say that the, the Jesus of the Bible is probably just a legend and probably not really as described. So we're going to talk about that tonight. Okay, so number two, what does the Bible say about Jesus' humanity? Well, first of all, and this could be a duh moment for us, he was born as a human. Jesus was born the same exact way that we were born. I mean, now some of you may have been born via C-section, or some, you know, but the point is we were all born of a woman. 
Well, let, I guess we can't, you know, assume that. Do we have any cyborgs or robots among us tonight? Or any test tube babies or mutants or aliens from other planets? Any? Okay, good. All right, that's good. We were all, he was born the way we are. Somebody tell me, what, what's a newborn baby like? What are some of the traits of a newborn baby? Helpless, helpless absolutely helpless. Awesome. What else? Tender. Tender, right? Very easily wounded, right? Yeah, totally dependent, right? Jesus was born that way, right? And it's amazing to think about the fact that he became so vulnerable in his humanity that he had to be you know, born as a real human. There's nothing scarier than holding a newborn baby, right? Because you have to hold the, their head just right, their head soft, and you, you, you drop them and they end up, I don't know, being a, I don't know, a, a Ravens fan or something. They just get a little messed up. In it a little bit. So you got to be careful to keep them an Eagles fan that God intended. Okay, so Galatians 4 forces this, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, and notice how he says this, born of a woman and born under the law. That is to say, he was born in the normal, natural way, and he was born into a real historical context. He was born in time, okay? Jesus is a real bona fide historical figure. So he was born as a human, and secondly, he experienced life as a human. Jesus really ate, and he really drank. He really did what we must do to survive. He really breathed air. The Bible says in Luke 2.52 that Jesus really grew. Now, in some uh, old paintings of Jesus, you'll notice sometimes that you'll see in, in a museum or something that they portray Jesus as already kind of an adult. And because they thought that when Jesus came out, he was probably fully functioning. But, but the reality is, is he came out just like a normal baby. He probably couldn't talk at first, right? And he had to grow into that. He was probably really small, and he grew. Thirdly, Jesus really experienced real human emotion. Now, this is one of the things that the early heretics really struggled with because they thought that any human emotion implied weakness. And so I think that's why one of the reasons, at least, why it's so important that Jesus was really human is to show us that our emotions are not necessarily weakness. They're not necessarily um, compromising. Notice this in John eleven thirty-five. 35. Uh, you can look it up later if you like. Jesus wept. Does anybody remember why he wept or where he wept? In Luke? Yeah, at the tomb of Lazarus, remember? Jesus went to see his friend. He knew full well he was about to raise him from the dead. He still cried. Why? Because that's the normal, reasonable, rational response when your friend dies. Right? He was really human. Not weak. He was strong. There was times when he was weary. This really blesses my heart. Let's read uh, John 4, 6. If you want to get there. John 4, 6. I say it blesses my heart because how many of you have ever been really tired? And you're thinking, I'm so weak. No, you're just human. It says in John 4, 6, Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Jesus got tired. Now, we see in the Bible that it's seemingly pretty often Jesus would go up on a mountain and pray all night, you know? So he, it wasn't that he was a, a wimp that needed, you know, 12 hours of sleep a day. No, but even his humanity had its limits. He was hungry, he was tired, he could feel pain. And that leads us to our next point here. Jesus really suffered, died, and rose again as a human. Now, this is super important, right? Because Docetism, one of the ancient heresies, what they believed is that, that Jesus only appeared human and that his sufferings were not really true. And some Gnostics, very early on, believed that the divine part of Jesus actually left him before the cross because they could not wrestle with the idea that God would suffer, right? In their brain, to be God means you never suffer. 
And so we need to understand that and reconcile to that, that Jesus really suffered as God in the flesh, as really human and really God. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4, it says this, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Last week, I got to see two places where they think Jesus' tomb was, which, shows, which tells you one very important thing, right? They don't really know where Jesus' tomb was, right? But there's the garden tomb, which looks better. It has a, the skull-looking carving in the rocks. And then there's the one that's right in Jerusalem area, and it's covered with all these, like, huge basilicas, and you have to go in a tunnel to see it. The moral of the story is we believe that that actually really happened, regardless of where exactly it was. We believe that Jesus was a real and is a real human being who died, really rose from the grave, and ascended to heaven. We believe that he is risen. Amen? Amen. Yeah. All right. Good, good. So why is this so important? We talked a little bit about this last time, but we have something that no other religion has, and that is we have somebody who willingly and willfully experienced our pain. Most of the other gods, in the, especially in the Roman system, the Greek system, and, but even today, are, are disconnected, perfect type beings that you suffer for. You know, like regular people suffer in service of their gods. We have a God who became what we are and suffered for us. And that's it's super important. In Hebrews 2.17, it says this, Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren. Why? That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Now, you notice what he says there. It's, it's amazing. Jesus is different than the false gods of false religions. Why? Because he experienced what we experience. When you're hungry, he gets that. When you're tired, he gets that. He experienced that. He's like us in all ways except for what? Sin, right? So any normal human limitation that you experience that is not sinful, he, is, he has walked a mile in those shoes. Because of that, Christ can more deeply and truly relate to your joy. I mean, think about that. Jesus was happy. See, we think, well, you know, Jesus suffered, we suffer. If you're a pessimistic kind of guy, you might think, no, he really gets us because he experiences all the bad things we experience. And you're right. But he also experiences the pure joy of humanity. Not in a disconnected sense, but in an experiential sense. Well, let me ask you, what are, what are the, some of the greatest things that human beings get to experience? Well, you think, you know, seeing a baby born, it's probably one of those uh, great things. Or friendship, you know, love. I mean, he didn't have romantic love, but love between brothers. You know, he, he got to see all that. Not to mention his own ministry where he got to see blind people become able to see and, and, and crippled people able to jump and dance. So Christ is more deeply and truly related to our joy. Thirdly, he's also able to be the propitiation for our sins, like we just read. And we all know, uh, well, maybe we don't. The word propitiation is a big word. It's a fancy word. What that word means is to appease the wrath of an angry God. That, so when you see propitiation, just think to appease the wrath of an angry God. Jesus had to be human to die in the place of humans. Because what God demanded was the one thing we can no longer provide, and that is a perfect life. So Jesus did that for us. If Jesus was just a spiritual being, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be acceptable as a propitiation. What God wants is blood and sacrifice. Fourthly, Christ is able to be the representative example for our lives. 1 John 2, 6 is this, He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. 
It's this idea that, <laughs> if we can say it this way, Jesus lived the kind of life we could live if we were perfect. But we can't always say, we can't say this, oh, I, there's no way I can do that. Well, Jesus did. I mean, imagine, and this may sound like a joke, but I don't mean it as a joke. Imagine being Jesus' brothers, right? Any of you have siblings that you've always lived in the shadow of? Can you imagine Jesus being your brother? You know, Mary all the time going, why can't you be more like him? Right? He's, he's the Messiah. That's why. He's perfect. But the point is, is that we, we are supposed to be like him. We are supposed to live like him. So Millard Erickson says here in your notes, one of the most controversial and yet crucial, that's a typo, crucial topics of Christian theology is the deity of Christ. It lies at the heart of our faith. For our faith rests on Jesus' actually being God in human flesh and not simply an extraordinary human, even the most unusual person who's ever lived. Okay, so now we're making a transition into our culture. In first century culture, they had no problem that Jesus claimed to be deity. They, they had people like that coming out of their ears. What they struggled with is that Jesus was actually human. Well, in our culture, it's the direct opposite. Wouldn't you agree? That even unbelieving liberal scholars will, you may have to probe them a little bit, but they will accept the fact that Jesus was a real human. But if you start talking about Jesus as God, that's when their eyes roll back in their head. And I think it's the same way even when we're talking to unbelievers and we're witnessing to them, when we start talking about Jesus as a great philanthropist, they love it, right? When we talk about Jesus as a teacher, they're fine. They're fine with that. When we talk about Jesus as God, that's when they're like, all right, that's enough, right? I mean, isn't that your experience? To say that Jesus was, you know, charitable, the world loves it. See, the world is not offended by Jesus' works. The world is offended by his claims. And it's the same today. You want to talk about how, how many great things the churches are doing, people will listen. You know, we're feeding people in this country. We're doing relief in that country. Everyone says, wow, that's really great. But when you start telling them, and Jesus is God, and you must bend your knee to him or you go to hell, that's, that's when they're out. So we need to be able to prove this, not only biblically for our own hearts, our own souls, but also in those opportunities that God gives us to witness to others. Now, I don't know if this is going to be all that helpful to you, but I'll try it anyway. Have you ever heard the expression, there's something in the water? Okay. I'm going to use the word water as a memory tool for the biblical proof of Jesus' deity. Okay. And so when, when somebody comes up to you and says, how do you know that Jesus is God? Uh, in your mind, I want you to think there's just something in the water. Okay. So let's, let's work through this. First of all, his works. Jesus does what only God can do. Jesus does what only God can do. And if Jesus does what only God can do, he must be God. That's the, the, the flow of thought there, okay? So let's look at it. So we already talked about this before. Before anything was created, what is the only thing that existed? God. So if the Bible says that Jesus is the creator of all things, then he has to be God. Only God can create all things because God is the only self-existent being in the universe. So John 1, 3, it says, all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. That is ascribing to Jesus something that can only be true of God. He is the creator. Another example is providence. Notice in Colossians 1.17, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. The him there is Jesus. So what Paul is, is asserting in Colossians 1.17 is this. Jesus is the one who keeps all the atoms together in the universe. That's something only God can do. 
Can you do that? I lose my keys twice a day, right? I can't keep everything straight. Jesus can. Why? Because he's not just a regular human. He's God. Another thing that we find here is Hebrews 1.3, which is just beautiful. It says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. That's saying that Jesus is what God is. And then it says this, And upholding all things by the word of his power. Can we do that? No. Can the, any other human even come close to this? No. Jesus is more than human. He's God. Another example here is Revelation. John 1, 18. It says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Only Jesus can do these kind of things, this revelation. And any time a human does this, it's God working through him. Revelation does not happen unless God makes it happen. So that's the W, works. There are certain things that Jesus does that only God can do. Okay? Now the second thing we'll look at is attributes. Attributes. Now, when I say this, what we're saying is this. There are certain things that are true of Jesus that can only be true about God. He has attributes that only God can have, like eternity, right? We, we talked about that when we talked about the attributes of God, that God is eternal that way and that way. The only being who is eternal that way and that way is God. And so we see this. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Revelation 1.8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. What is he saying? He's saying, I am the beginning, I am the end. I am eternal. This is a claim to be God. He is also referring to himself as I am. If you still have John open, flip over a little bit to the right. John chapter 8. I love this. This is great. I'll give you a second. John 8, 58. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, that's a loaded statement, right? Because he's contrasting himself with Abraham, who in the minds of the Jews, I mean, he, he, was, he was tops. He says, before Abraham was even an inkling, he doesn't say, I was. He says, I am, which is a reference to the sacred name, the nomina sacra, Yahweh, right? So Jesus is saying, I'm God. Now, how do we know that? Well, the next verse, right? Notice how they reacted. I love it. Verse 59. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Why do you stone people in this culture? It's for blasphemy. What this tells us is that they clearly understood that Jesus was himself claiming to be God. Sometimes on these like Discovery Channel you know, programs, that you'll see the scholars there will sometimes say things like this, that Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah, that he never claimed to be God. That was just later. Well, according to the best and only historical record we have, he did indeed claim to be God. Thirdly, Jesus is all-powerful. He's called Mighty God in Isaiah 9, 6. He showed power over life and death, and we, I'll leave you to read those passages later. Only God has power over life and death. And to explain that and to prove that, I need a volunteer, I will kill you, and then we'll see if anybody else can bring you back. See, even in the Old Testament, when prophets were able to raise people from the dead, it was all by God's power, not their own. Jesus does it by his own power. He is God. 
Also, we see that Jesus is omniscient. That's, you know, he's all-knowing. We talked about this with the attributes of God. I love this, John 2, 24. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. I, this is so great. We trust Jesus. Jesus does not trust us. Right? We entrust our lives to Jesus. He does not entrust his life to us. He knew what we were about. Verse 25, and he had no need that anyone should testify of man, or of man, for he knew what was in man. He has knowledge that only God has. Also, omnipresence, top of page 14. Jesus says this in Matthew 28, 20, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, unless he was only talking to one of them, which would be strange, He's claiming to be everywhere. Wherever they go, he's with them. That's what he's claiming. He's claiming omnipresence. That's an attribute of God. Excuse me. He also claimed holiness. Holiness. He claimed to be the spotless moral character that only God is. I'll leave you to look up those verses later. And then the last thing he claimed was sovereignty. First Peter three twenty two, who is going who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. He is God. So when somebody comes up to you or knocks on your door, if you feel like talking to them, and they you say Jesus is God, they go, How can you believe that? You say works. Or something in the water works he does only things that only god can do attributes there are, his personality his person is such that only god could be that way the the next thing we'll see is his titles now we won't go through this in detail because we talked about it so much last week or last time titles jesus is called things that are only appropriate to call god like John 20, 28, when Thomas says, my Lord and my God. To call Jesus my God, if he's not God, would be blasphemous. And so we would understand that Jesus would correct him if he was not claiming to be God. But he was, and he is. So we'll leave those, uh, go through your notes next time. Um, or from last week, if you, if you want to review some of those things. So we, it's all in the water, right? So we've got works, attributes, titles, and now we get to these last two are kind of hard to remember, but we'll, we'll plow through exceptions. 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 Now, what does this mean? This means that Jesus is... There are things that Jesus can do that no man can do. He is ex he's exceptional. There are certain things that Jesus can do that if we were to try to do these things, we would be blaspheming. Okay? So let's talk about these. First of all, like we talked about already, Jesus is worshipped as deity. That, he's the exception. He's the only human being you can worship as a deity. Right? That's an exception. If you come to me after my sermon... What? Not if. When you come to me after my sermon and say, a voice of a God and not a man, I will correct you. I'll thank you, but then I'll correct you. Because I don't want to die. If after my sermon, you come and you fall at my feet, I will tell you, get up. Worship God. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus accepts that worship. Why? Because he is God. It's the, perfectly natural for him to accept worship because he's God. Okay? Now, why is this an exception? When we talked about these, we'll, we'll just kind of skip over these. We already talked about this. But notice, this was interesting. I didn't bring it up earlier, that Satan wanted to be worshiped. Remember? The devil says, I'll give you all this. I'll, I'll give you the kingdom without the cross. Just fall at my feet and worship me. And Jesus said, it's inappropriate to worship something that isn't God. See, that's important, right? Because later he will accept worship. It's an implied claim to be 
God. The third thing we see that Jesus can do, he, he is the exception of all humans, is that he can forgive sin. Now, we can forgive when people trans transgress against us, right? But what we cannot do is remove their guilt. What we can do is extend grace, and we can say, look, I'm just like you. What Jesus can do is remove guilt. What Jesus can do is take on himself the punishment of that sin. So when he says your sins are forgiven, it means a little bit more than when we say it, right? Like when somebody comes, Dom, I'm so sorry, I whatever, and I go, no, it's no problem. Well, I, that doesn't remove any guilt. It just, it brings peace to the situation. Jesus can literally and honestly say your sins are forgiven. And we know this because he says this in Mark 2, 11. I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. And remember what the the Jews said in response to that, they go, Who, who's this guy to forgive sins? So they understood that he was making a claim that was much more than simple, you're okay. No, he was saying, your guilt is taken away. We can't do that. He's the exception of all humans. And fourthly, he is to be obeyed. Now imagine if I came up to you and I said this, I want you to be my friend. But to be my friend, you got to do everything I tell you to do. How close are we going to get? Not that close, right? Because humans don't like that from other humans. Notice what Jesus says, verse uh, John fifteen fourteen: You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. You see that? He's different than just a regular guy. He's an exceptional human. He can demand obedience that we can't because it's inappropriate for us, but it's not inappropriate for him because he's God. That's the point. So when somebody comes up to you in Walmart just out of the blue and says, how can you believe that Jesus is God? You say, well, there's just something in the water, I guess. Works. Jesus does what only God can do. Attributes. Jesus is what only God can be titles. Jesus is called what it's only appropriate to call God. Exceptions. Jesus is different from us in ways that shows that he is God. And the last thing is references. References. Now, when you're applying for a job, references are pretty important, aren't they? I always... When I, I'm asked to be a reference for somebody, I always end every sentence with this phrase, when he's sober. Because <laughs> no matter what you say, that takes the, you know, takes the shine off it, right? Like, he's really great with people when he's sober, you know, things like that. He's really reliable when he's sober, right? But no, we lean a lot on what other people say about you if you're applying for a job, and it's rightfully so, right? Well, Jesus has references too, and I want to share with you some of the people in the Bible that call him God, that ascribe deity to him, okay? First of all, God does. God the Father. We talked about this a little bit last time, but this is where I always go with Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons when they come to the door and when I feel up to talking to them, because I don't always, so I just ignore them sometimes. But I'll, I always ask this, if I can show you that God the Father calls Jesus God, would you believe it? They have to say yes, we bring him here. Hebrews 1.8 says this, but to the Son, he, that's God the Father, says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. You see what he's doing here? The Father is calling the Son God. You can't get past that. If God calls Jesus, as Jesus God, he must be God. But Jesus has other references. Peter in Matthew 16, 16 said this, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And remember two weeks ago we talked about the fact that the Son of God title is a divine title. He's saying you have the attributes of God. Like when you say somebody, or when he says that they're the sons of thunder, what he's saying is they have the attributes of thunder, when, you know, we, as we talked about last time. Paul, thirdly, calls Jesus God. And Colossians 2.9 was one of my first verses I ever knew because I went to a college. I got saved my senior year in high school. First year in college, I'm in a college that's predominantly Mormon in uh, northern Wyoming. 
And when they found out I was religious, they wanted to talk to me about religious things. And I knew maybe five verses of the Bible at that point by heart, but this was one of them. And so there's this girl that I worked with. I was a dishwasher at the school cafeteria. I even had a superhero persona. I called myself the spraying mantis. That was one of the best jobs I read. That was fun, just spraying, you know. But the, the, you know, these, the Mormon kids, you know, they would come up to me and they would say, you know, why aren't you a Mormon? Why don't you do this or that? And I, and I would say, because uh, Paul says, for in him, that's Jesus, dwells the fullness of Godhead bodily. What this verse says is that everything that is God is in Jesus. And I said, you guys don't go far enough with that. And eventually, a couple of them said, stop talking to Dom about this. And I was like, okay, it was great. See, and we already talked about Thomas saying, my Lord and my God. People call Jesus God in the New Testament. And those are some pretty good references. But there's one more that's even better in your notes. You'll see letter D, Jesus himself claimed to be God. Would you, would you look with me at John 10 if you still have your Bibles open? And you don't have to if you don't want to. I'll, I'll read the verse, but in John 10, we'll start in verse 29. No, we'll do 28. John 10, 28 says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. That's got to ring in our ears will never perish because Jesus gives us eternal life, okay? And no one will snatch them out of my hand. That's eternal security, right? Verse 29, my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. And then he says this, I and my father are one. Now, is he saying one in purpose? That's what people say, well, we're on the same side. No, what he's saying is we share an essence. We share an attribute, a divinity. And we know this because, verse 31 again, the Jews picked up stones to stone him, and Jesus answered them, I love this, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? It's humor. But you see what he's saying? He's saying, I did a lot of great things. Which one of my great things are leading you to kill me? It's not about his works. They were fine with his works. It's his doctrine they didn't like. It's the same today. They say this. The Jews answered him, It's not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. And Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, You are God's? Now, what Jesus is doing here is picking up on a, a very popular rabbinic teaching of his time where the rabbis would teach that they were gods, not in a literal sense, but in a lowercase g sense, that they were God's emissaries. And so what Jesus is saying here is, you call yourselves God all the time. Why are you stoning me for claiming to be God? Jesus' character was totally different than the Pharisees, but we'll get to that some other time. So this forces us to the famous four opinions. If Jesus claimed to be God, we have four options. Either one, he was lying. He was a liar, a false teacher, unless he's God. Now, let's be very clear and plain about that. Let's dispense with this liberal notion that Jesus was a good moral teacher. If he claimed to be God and he was not God, he's a bad moral teacher just like anybody else who claims to be God today. David Koresh claimed to be God. He, he, he was a bad moral teacher, not a good one. So maybe Jesus is a false teacher. Or maybe he's just nuts, right? Maybe he's a lunatic. Maybe he thought he was God, just like the, the guy who's trying to get clean off of drugs thinks he's God. Maybe he's seeing visions or he's whacked out in the head. I mean, some people would say that, I suppose. It's an uncomfortable position to come to, even as an unbeliever, I would imagine, but they do. Maybe he was just a legend. Maybe he didn't really exist at all. Maybe he was created by storytellers. Now, that's a, a real hard sell, especially when 
you just get back from Israel, right? Where you're, you're seeing that Jesus was all over the place. So if he's not a liar, and if he's not a lunatic, and if he's not a legend, he's God. He's the Lord. So the conclusion then is that Jesus is the God-man. He's fully human and fully God at the same time. And this is what we call the hypostatic union. Okay? It's a great word to impress your friends with. All right. What is the hypostatic union? The hypostatic union is simply this. We believe that in the person of Jesus, Jesus is fully God and fully man and we don't really know how that works together, so we just say it's in, it's in unity somehow. The great statement from the uh, Council of Chalcedon in your notes is this, Christ is to be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly, meaning they're not mixed, unchangeably, meaning that they'll never change, indivisibly, meaning that they're not in parts, and inseparably. The distinction of natures being by no means taken away from the union, by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person. Please commit that to memory and be, no, just kidding. Be ready to recite that on demand. Now, it's, it's wordy, right? But that was back in 451 AD. Here's the explanation. Christ is fully man and fully God without confusion. That means the two natures are not mixed. It's without change. That means that the deity of Christ did not have to be destroyed for him to be man. Some people take Philippians 2 that way. When it says he emptied himself, they say, well, he stopped being God for a while. That is impossible. God cannot stop being God without division. That means there's not, he's not part God and part man like these monstrous Roman gods and Greek gods. And without separation, there are not two Christs. There's one Christ with two aspects of his being. All right, so one last, one last quote from a guy named Henry Thiessen. It says, this is an area of deep mystery. How can there be two natures and yet but one person? Though this is a difficult concept to understand, which I would argue is not true. This is not difficult to understand. It's impossible to understand. There's a difference. The scriptures nevertheless encourage a consideration of the mystery of God, even Christ. The study of the person of Christ is very difficult because in this respect, he is, it should be he, he is unique. There is no other being like him, and so we cannot reason from the known to the unknown. Jesus is different than us, and he's like us, and he's totally different from us, and he's like us. He is God. He's man. He is human. He's divine. He's Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, who's worthy to, to talk about these things? We're amazed. We're amazed that you are God. That your nature is fully divine. That your nature is fully human. That we don't understand that. We cannot understand that. But we just bow to the mystery of it. Lord, I pray that this would stir us to do what is the only reasonable response to these things. That is to worship Jesus. And we do that. You are our Lord and our God, creator of all things. You are the word that was made flesh and dwelt among us. Lord, I pray that as we discuss this and as we spend some time together tonight, that you would be central in our thoughts and in our talk. To the praise of your glory, in Jesus' name, amen.